in the book text for just a second. This image is from a memorial guide application that we created uh, and we launched last year. This is the location of Mark Joseph Colayo's name. Mark lived in Tribeca with his wife and with his two children. He was a senior managing director at Cantor Fitzgerald, where he had recruited his brother Stephen to join him as a broker. He also helped his brother-in-law, Tom Pettuccini, find a job at Cantor. And you can see the names of the three men are inscribed together here in the bronze among the expanse of their fellow Cantor employees. Howard Lutnick, the chairman of Cantor Fitzgerald, said in an oral history with the memorial, we had a rule at the firm that we should hire our friends, that life is too short. We wanted to work with people we liked. And that rule applied not only to me, where I hired my best friend and my brother, but it also applied to the guys who were the security guards, who worked with their brother and their brother-in-law. And we lost them all that day. Unthinkable. Around both memorial pools, the order of the names from where major geographic groupings are located to which company would follow the one before it was all driven by the personal adjacency requests from victims' families. The first responders section of the memorial, for example, is linked intimately to the beginning of the World Trade Center section on the South Memorial Pool through, through a request from a loved one. Donald James McIntyre, a Port Authority police officer for 15 years, had been on duty on February 26, 1993, the first bombing at the World Trade Center. He helped escort workers to safety, and on 9-11, he and his wife's cousin, John Anthony Sherry, were both there. John was a trader at Eurobrokers in the South Tower. When Donald called his wife that morning, the last thing she heard was that he was rushing to the 84th floor where John's offices were located. For their names to be next to one another, the 61 Euro brokers' names in the World Trade Center section immediately follow the first responders section, which ends with the 37 Port Authority police officers. Some of the most heart-rending stories of families experiencing multiple losses come from the four flights. On flight 175 was a family of three, Daniel Raymond Brandhorst and Ronald L. Gamboa, who were traveling with their son David, only three years old. Because their last names were different, the three are among the many examples of families whose names would have been separated under a conventional alphabetical arrangement. As the buildings rise around the memorial, the 2,983 names are there in quiet witness. Cut through bronze, they represent thousands of memories made permanent, absences filled with light in times of darkness. Those few examples that I just read, many more of which are in the book, stand for hundreds of deeply personal stories behind the memorial. While they're heartbreaking to hear, to me they also represent the ultimate reminder that it's the connections in our lives that matter the most. As staff of the memorial, we've had the privilege of coming to know so many families who lost loved ones in the attacks. They've graciously led us into their lives, allowing us to come to know in some way those who perished. The meaningful adjacencies concept was also behind one of the most moving things I witnessed on the anniversary itself this year. No matter where you looked, you saw people coming together. They might have been families reuniting, standing next to two cousins they had lost, or they might have been strangers who had never met before, but who knew their son's name was next to his best friend's, or the one who shared the cubicle next to him at work. And they paused to introduce themselves and embrace when they saw someone come up to trace the name next to their loved ones. In the aftermath of the attacks, we felt the bonds that unite us as New Yorkers, as Americans, as part of humanity strengthened. And we should take just comfort in knowing that when circumstances require, we will come together and take care of one another with limitless compassion. That's the positive legacy of 9-11, and it's at the core of everything we do at the Memorial Museum. Thank you so much for inviting us tonight, and it's my pleasure to introduce my co-author and friend, Lynn Rasick. And once Lynn speaks, we're happy to answer any questions.
Um, thank you, Allison, and thank you, Ellen, for hosting us this evening. Um, I've been honored and privileged to work on rebuilding the World Trade Center in one way or another for much of the past 10 years, uh, first as Deputy Press Secretary to Mayor Giuliani, um, later working for Governor Pataki. Um, and in 2005, I joined the Memorial Foundation just a couple months after it started operations. Um, as you know, this past September, we successfully opened the first part of the new World Trade Center, our nation's tribute to the nearly 3,000 men, women, and children taken from us too soon. More than 10,000 people who lost loved ones 10 years ago attended the anniversary ceremony, and I wanted to share with you a few images from that day. Like every year since September 11, 2001, the names of the victims were read aloud in a solemn and moving ceremony. The act of reading the names has served as a memorial in of itself, filling a void because the families had no permanent memorial. This year, as the names were read by family members, remembering their brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters, people could physically touch their loved one's name inscribed in bronze and know that from that day forward, they will always have a place of remembrance. In writing the book, Allison and I hoped that we could provide a window into the journey that led to the creation of our nation's memorial, which is now visited by approximately 10,000 people each day. As you can imagine, the journey has been a complicated one. There was a public mandate to rebuild the World Trade Center right after the attacks and to rebuild it quickly. The project was emotionally and politically charged. How could it not be? This was the largest attack on American soil, and there were deep-seated emotions, opinions, and feelings about what should be built and how we should memorialize on 16 acres of space in one of the busiest cities in the world, and at the very site where thousands of lives were taken. Magnifying these complications were the engineering and construction challenges associated with building a half dozen mega projects at the World Trade Center site. Within just a few city blocks, the World Trade Center master plan includes five major skyscrapers, housing over 10 million square feet of office space, the third largest transportation hub in New York City,